Thank you, Athena. That was very kind. And thank you also to Sky and the organizers for um, including, inviting me, and going through this entire process of getting me here. Um, I'm going to begin also uh, with a recent work and then dive back into the 19 teens and 20s. Crashed, Adam Tuza's History of the Economic Crisis Since 2008, plays on its subjects medical language time and again. Quote, given the risks of contagion, how could states not act? End quote. He asks about the bailouts in an expression that appears some 25 times. Integration and disintegration, even more frequently naturalized medical terms, appear on 88 occasions. Other bodily metaphors abound in, uh, in that book. Bo body politic, uh, this is the beginning, the disequilibrium, body blow, crash, hurt, an entire political, economic, physiological universe that has become current again. This isn't to target twos. In Fire and Blood, Enzo Traversa repeats crisis 48 times, collapse 32, and so on and so forth. Um, this language is ubiquitous. It's an arsenal of metaphors that we have naturalized and speak all the time. Its component bioweapons lace economic policy and thought, as well as the simple everyday ways in which we talk about finance and politics. As Robert Peckham has also argued for just one more example, a language of banking ecosystems and economic biology has become normative in the study of financial risk since the mid-1990s, all the more so a rhetoric deriving from the epidemiology of emerging infectious diseases. Now, too often we forget that bodily metaphors are not some inconsequential ornament or some easily naturalized language, but they slant, modulate, and structure the way that we think about politics and economics, about promise and pain. Medical metaphors in the sense of a body economic alongside and deriving from bodies physical and politic have been key in the past century. William Beveridge famously spoke of the economic cycle in the early 1900s as the pulse of the nation. Earlier still, in the, early, in the late early modern era, Reinhard Koselleck reminds us, crisis itself moved from medical to political and theological ideas and shock from a military notion toward an argument on the organism's suffering. How these metaphors are negotiated plays a constant role in the political landscape, particularly in the Trump years. The same way that Obamacare signaled for its enemies a threat and an oxymoron when it doubled the promise of care with a racialized fear of Obama himself, the same way that Trump's draining the swamp derives from yellow fever and malaria control ideologies entirely coextensive with the anti-immigrant rhetoric uh, that he daily deploys. Now, how did this medical and political language develop, and when did it become entirely uh, germane to the modern political world? The emergence of a key series of medical metaphors around bodily integration and disintegration surrounds Mossy's writing from nationalism and sexuality through the image of man, and yet it works in a rather different way from his priorities. For Mossy, the language that mattered in the establishment of fascism involved a set of metaphors about the construction of the memory of dead soldiers, not living ones, and similarly the sexualization of male bonds in Aryan unity. Instead, I am curious here about the uses of medical ideas of crisis, imbalance, disequilibrium, and injury, ideas aimed at disruption, recovery, and rehabilitation. This language was shared across political positions and also helped construct them. So I'm curious, in a way, about how it drifted leftward in the post-World War I period and how it contributed to the establishment of the welfare states as machines of life. But it does nonetheless involve elements to which, as Mossy better than anyone has shown, fascism responded by insisting on a kind of healthy bodily bulk. In the period after World War I, concepts and metaphors of crisis, shock, collapse, and catastrophe organized perhaps the key political language through which Europeans of all political stripes, but especially of the center left, experienced and talked about much of the 1920s and 1930s. The language was not natural, nor was it automatically political. But for its growth in the interwar, think for example of crisis theology like Tillich's, or the famous angel of Benjamin's that watches catastrophes pile one upon the other. Or think of the constant risk, crash, and collapse rhetoric that in the mid-1920s ostensibly threatened the international economic systems in ways then actualized in the 1929 crash in Austrian German politics in 1933-34 and, and for the Spanish left. Discussions of crisis in the physical body far predated the war, of course, but their particular accent emerged in direct parallel with medical discussions notably with physiological and neurological theories that saw the human organism as a tightly integrated but very brittle whole. 
Neurologists, surgeons, and physiologists had for a decade before 1914 looked at forms of bodily regulation and integration. Now, before 1900, most medical physiological thought concentrated on specific parts of the body, especially on organs or on forms of evolutionary development. Then, a break. Hormones and fluid regulation were discovered in 1903 through 1905. In 1906, the integrative action of the nervous system, for whose study and naming Charles Sherrington later won the Nobel Prize, uh, recalibrated neurology. By 1910-1912, the fluids of the body had become key biochemical as well as systemic concerns, and emotions were systematically, across different paradigms, correlated with internal chemical changes. Now, once bullets and shell shards began to tear through human bodies, often in unprecedented ways, doctors discovered that they could not anticipate the effects of a particular injury, they could not control its sequelae, and they could not standardize treatment. In the past, they had relied on laws of the body. But now, alongside regulated bodies, they started speaking of the borderline or even of no man's land conditions between different uh, organized ones, which are now dominating care or the, dominating the need for care, but which could not be folded into standard accounts of disease. Already interested in integration, they prioritized forms of body-wide injury and suffering whose rationales depended on the particulars of each case. In studies of whole body conditions known as wound shock, uh, and soldier's heart, researchers identified that two patients injured in very similar ways could have vastly different experiences of disorder. A particularly worrisome patient might easily survive, while another, lightly injured, could die from the body's response to the injury itself. Highlighting balance and disequilibrium, British, German, and American researchers actively developed integrative theories intended to explain the body and the mind's responses to local aggressions. Uh, they also turned to study individual cases, and case histories proliferated dramatically, as did the logic of the case as a quasi-individual condition. Ernest Southard uh, published a book of 1,000 pages with 600 cases deployed in it in 1918. Each body, at any rate, responded to threat or injury, they argued, in a highly individualized fashion, because this response was mediated by the complex regulatory systems that underwrote its wholeness and its normal functioning its circulation, respiratory, hormonal, and so on. Um, the body was even capable of destroying itself. In wound shock, for example, an organism injured even in a rather light way on the thigh could hide blood to stop it from draining out. But this protective move, especially in the cold, sent blood pressure uh, nose diving, and so system after system after system in docker and respiratory circulation began to collapse. What mattered was not the bullet, but the response, which was now compounding. Now, in their work, the organism confronted with injury became a whole, often at the moment when it was most under threat. By the end of the war, even more so by the late 1920s, these scientists developed new conceptions according to which the body or the brain was deeply integrated because it was so brittle. It was so integrated in order to avoid this brittleness, and yet it could cause uh, the breakdown itself. To use the Harvard physiologist uh, Walter B. Cannon's neologism from 1928-29, the organism lives in a profoundly unstable homeostasis. The seemingly obscure and technical operations through which physiologists and neurologists theorized these behaviors were immediately recognized as crucial for understanding the emotions, pain, the disintegration of behavior, and the individualized long-term effects of violence. Kurt Goldstein, a German neurologist, worked with brain-injured uh, soldiers and tracked how they responded over time in highly individualized fashion to particular lesions. Henry Dale researched toxicological devastation resulting from even slight imbalances of otherwise essential, even necessary, bodily substances. Walter Cannon later even spoke of voodoo death, that is to say physiological collapse resulting, as in wound shock, from sorcery or emotional disturbance. Um, this is a super influential paper from 1945 in the American Anthropologist that became key for anthropological understandings of um, magic and witchcraft. Other intellectuals followed suit. In uh, 1920, Freud invented the death drive specifically to accommodate and to obviate the rapid spread of approaches to disintegration. Marcel Mauss abandoned the idea of symbolism advanced by his mentor and uncle, Emile Durkheim, for an alternative symbolic 
that he drew explicitly from the little known British physiologist Henry Head, so as to better unite social cohesion with bodily wholeness. And then there's Virginia Woolf, to whom I will return. Now, traditional metaphors declined. For example, the body as a machine, or as, sorry, Andy, a motor. Um, and metaphors with evolutionist and racist implications, degeneration or Jan Smuts's holism, were also sidelines, at least among liberals and socialists. Fabian socialists advocated terms like organism and regulation in language from the physiology of hormonal regulation. Leonard Wolf's International Government of 1916 adopted these terms already, but in a rather flat, often unselfconscious unself -conscious way that would become standard in much of the language of the League of Nations. Leonard Hobhouse set aside his earlier evolutionist metaphors to assault contemporary Hegelian influence in the metaphysical theory of the state of 1919 with analogies of the individual and social body that derived specifically from the language of disintegration. Um, that book began like this, quote, people be naturally begin to think about social questions when they find that there's something going wrong in social life. Just as in the physical body, it is the ailment that interests us while the healthy processes go on without our being aware of them, so a society in which everything is working smoothly and in accordance with the accepted opinion of what is right and proper raises no question for its own members. That ambiguity is what uh, was key here. That, that flip was what was key here. The key reference by 1920 was a concept of the individual who had proven so easily destructible. However loudly an individual claimed to be in control of him or herself, once faced with injury, his or her body disintegrated, even destroyed itself while trying to protect itself, precisely because it was so uh, tightly wound together. Now, Mosse would almost certainly see this idea as classically bourgeois and not as directly political as the intellectual historical work he did toward the rise of fascism. The social body that he concentrated on was one for which medical solutions and figures of speech were not as influential. The body to social body analogies were focused on masculine sexuality and on a different kind of survival after catastrophe. A catastrophe signaled by the death of others and the nationalist and political imperative to respond. The resexualized masculine body could then be understood as linked to the injured or medically recuperating body, but I will leave the wife for the Q&A if need be. I should add here that from the perspective of a medical economic administrators of social life who spread across the major states uh, in, in the 1920s and 1930s, the sense of a body that is wound together but can unravel demanded a particular kind of intervention. If intellectuals of the fascist variety who advocated a stronger, tighter social body constituted one kind of political minded group, Technocrats and medically minded intellectuals assured that the body would fall apart time and again, uh, who were assured that the body would fall apart time and again when confronted with crisis invented a quite different one, one in which social planning and management at both the individual and the society-wide levels mattered the most. Now this idea of integration and shattering played out all the more in the economic and international scene. When the British physiologist Ernest Starling, who had invented the term hormone, visited Germany in 1919 to report to the British Parliament on food conditions in Germany, his results made their way directly into Keynes's economic consequences of the peace, which also, by the way, opens with a homeostatic um, metaphor. A population systematically undernourished was, Keynes echoed, both physically unable to withstand tensions and disorder and bound to take up disruptive political projects. Starling thoroughly agreed. In his 1930, uh, other economists agreed as well. In his 1930 theory of business cycles, titled Economic Rhythm, the German statistician Ernst Wagemann, head of the Weimar Statistical Office and the Institute for Business Cycle Research, explicitly lifted the term functional from medical terminology. Functional disease referred to whole body conditions uh, or conditions without visible legions, lesions. So Wagemann endorsed the study of economic symptomatology in a decidedly biological organic character, he said. He then celebrated the German Business Research Institute for representing the medical point of view. And he replicated uh, doctors' arguments on internal integration and the priority of internal integration over external stimuli, even stimuli as important as wars. Violence didn't kill you, he argued, your response did. The economist Wilhelm Röpke, later one of the stars of order liberalism, had few qualms about using biological metaphors to blame liberalism for causing the, quote, progressive disintegration and atomization of the body politic. You can see where this is going. And he used hormones, vitamins, body temperature, and anemia to make his points. 
He continued, quote, the ultimate conditions for the working of the economic process lie outside of the strictly economic sphere, end quote, and he pointed to modern medicine instead. Now, with the market crash of 1929, this became an American story too, especially as a rhetoric of integration helped create a culture of crisis. Cynthia Russett first detailed this in her The Concept of Equilibrium in American Social Thought in 1966. The system crisis binary and the political and economic desire to maintain equilibrium became especially pressing after 1929. Just as physicians were turning to neo-Hippocratic ideas to suggest that the organism might do best to heal itself rather than wait for a doctor's intervention, Hoover's administration accentuated the language of regulation, cooperation, and integration in part to avoid interfering in the economy. The Harvard Business School facilitated a number of interdisciplinary exchanges and circles seeking to develop models of business stability, equilibrium maintenance, general systems, and industrial labor and social administration. Physiology, most significantly that of Lawrence J. Henderson, answered the call. Henderson, a sort of eminence grise at Harvard, began a Pareto circle to disseminate Wilfredo Pareto's wartime arguments on integration and disintegration, as well as his own ones. The circle then proceeded to include influential contemporaries from Elton Mayo to Talcott Parsons, and then the Harvard Fatigue Lab. Of course, Roosevelt's New Deal used a different language, but a no less medical one. The crash had to be handled by better forms of integration and regulation. Harvard faculty that tended toward the left also used the very same metaphors. Walter Cannon, who coined homeostasis and supported the New Deal, had some qualms, but only some, about biological power. Quote, in the light of biological experience, social stabilization should be sought not in a fixed and rigid social system, but in such adaptable and commercial functions as assure continuous supplies of elementary human needs, end quote. By the mid-1930s, the crisis had shaped the integration crisis duet into central component of social thought. When, in 1936, John Dewey lectured at the Harvard Tercentenary on authority and social change, and declared himself willing to find an organic union for the social organization of individuality, authority, and freedom, he was preaching to the faithful, including several of the people I've mentioned uh, who were in the audience. By the end of World War II, this language had become even more pervasive. Lewis Mumford turned organic regulation and integration into a metaphor for liberal individualism and a rationale for its American muscular defense. In the condition of man, he celebrated biological integration and homeostasis as nothing less than the essential components of human nature, praising Cannon and others for having, quote, established the importance of man's internal environment. And this was more important than even Darwin. Um, he goes on and on. I'm going to skip the, the quote itself. Suffice it to say that this comes at the very beginning, and the condition of man continues as though building out from these insights. Georges Canguilhem, hands down the most significant and influential philosopher in France in the mid-century, and oddly the cl closest to the Frankfurt School, implemented Goldstein, Head, and Cannon's thinking in his thoroughgoing critique of norms, the normal and the pathological, uh, which was published in 1943. Writing in occupied France and with Nazism purification, Nazism's purification of the national body and mind, Conguilhem forcefully rejected, on behalf of the brittle and threatened individual, the equivalences between norm, the normal and the healthy, and any sense of a given type or norm, national or universal. A few years later, in cybernetics, controlling communication in the animal and the machine, Norbert Wiener also appealed to Cannon's homeostasis for the intellectual basis for understanding the regulation of information passing through a system via feedback mechanisms. He even spoke of social homeostasis. Quote, strange and even repugnant as the customs of barbarians may seem to us, they have a very definite homeostatic value, end quote. By comparison, Modern society had difficulty controlling information and action at a distance, a problem compounded by, quote, the game of money, one of the chief anti-homeostatic elements in the community, end quote. Later, Wiener would identify disorganization as the enemy. I noted when I began that medical metaphors will likely play a key role in the future of the welfare state, so perhaps I should trawl this line of flight instead of concluding for a bit. Perhaps no other policy domain was influenced by these metaphors as much as that of the welfare state, because while medical care was becoming standardized and ever more reliant on statistics in the 1920s, it was also becoming more committed to individual patients. 
Starling proposed that thanks to new theories of integration, quote, the mastery of disease and pain will enable us to relieve the burden of mankind, end quote. The heart, he insisted, was no longer the sovereign king over the rest of the body, but a community of goods to be safeguarded and supported against crisis and unnecessary suffering. With the famous 1942 beverage report, this ideal was enshrined. As Michel Foucault would later put it, health was transformed into an object of state concern, not for the benefit of the state, but for the benefit of individuals. Man's right to maintain his body in good health became an object of state action, end quote. Beverages, Famous formulation of the five giant ills, want, ignorance, squalor, idleness, caused by lack of jobs. I can't remember what the fifth one is, or I haven't written it. Turned social physiology into policy morality. But even the most empowering of metaphors can play nasty little games. By the 1960s, yeah. by the 1960s, uh, the very same ideas that doctors and the state had to take care of individuals, that individual care trumped standardized care, that it was possible and necessary because of the complexity of internal systems and the ensuing ease of disintegration was now turned against the welfare state. This was no neoliberal plan. It was the crash, pun intended, of a utopia to relieve the burden of mankind. The rise of anti-medicine with intellectuals like Michael Ballant, René Dubois, uh, R.D. Lang, Rollo May, and especially Ivan Illich routinely cited the very same medical thinkers and ideas that I have discussed in support of individuality. Illich's 1975 medical nemesis, the, appropriate, the expropriation of health, demanded the personal recapturing of health from the welfare state. And he used the very same language and the very same metaphors. Now, um, I'm, going to skip the, the, I'm going to skip the quote, and I would leave things with that on the slyness of, of metaphors that enabled and then disabled the welfare state, but I promised that I would end back with Virginia Woolf. And so, Wolf knew some of these physiologists, and in 1926, shortly before Orlando, and certainly in line with its anti-normative thinking, she demanded a new literature of illness. Quote, it is not only a new language that we need, primitive, subtle, sensual, obscene, but a new hierarchy of the passions. Love must be deposed in favor of a temperature of 104. Jealousy must give place to the pangs of sciatica. Sleeplessness must play the part of villain, and the hero become a white liquid with a sweet taste." End quote. Right then, she offered the most beautiful shorthand of the ethical challenge of this condition of brittle, individualized survival. Quote, but with the hook of life still in us, still we must wriggle. We cannot stiffen peaceably into glassy mounds. Thank you.